I'm excited to talk with you all today about stuff that I enjoy thinking about. I'm excited to hear stuff that you enjoy thinking about as well. Um, but uh, okay, let's go. So my research goal at a very high level is to sense input performed with physical devices that are deeply custom, or you could think like well-suited to the user, their task, and the context that they're in. And as Michael noted, I use digital fabrication for this a lot because I find it's a very nifty tool. So what is digital fabrication? Do any of you know? Have any of you ever done digital fabrication? What is it? Well, uh, somehow uh, using digital media to transform physical matter. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, you take digital stuff and you make it into physical stuff. So this, as computer scientists, is very exciting for us because we're really good at making digital stuff. Um, I also, as I mentioned in my research statement, think a lot about sensing. So what's sensing? Nobody? Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, no worries. You'll so, fail 347. <laughs> um, so when I think about sensing, I think about I'm doing something in the physical world. So like I'm pushing my mouse and I want to move the pointer on the screen, right? But there's a lot of different ways that I can sense this actual interaction. So today's mice usually use a laser on the bottom. So we look at the flow of, uh, of data as I slide it across the table. Older mice used a physical ball rolling around that we measure the rotation of. Um, but we can get a little more exotic. So if I know what table I'm moving my mouse on, maybe I can set up some microphones and listen to where on the table I'm moving it. It's also my body that's actually moving. So if I use a Kinect, I can see how my arm is transforming and turn that into mouse motion. Um, or I can even listen actually to my muscles, uh, listen to the electrical signals going through my muscles to see, OK, where am I pushing the mouse? How hard am I pushing it? So sensing uh, straddles the line between the physical world and the digital world, but it's extremely flexible. There's a lot of different ways to think about sensing. So sensing goes between the physical world and the digital world, and digital fabrication goes between the digital world and the physical world. So this is uh, maybe a thing that you remember from an early CS uh, HCI class, but I think of this as like the gulf of fabrication and the gulf of sensing. Did I just hear a groan? It's good. No. <laughs> um, so this is how I like to think about my research. I'm thinking about, instead of execution and evaluation, I'm thinking about the gulf of fabrication and the gulf of sensing. And the stuff I like to think about in these contexts are called tangible input devices. Um, so all of these objects are what I would call tangible input devices, and they're sort of physical ways that we give form to digital information. So instead of just pulling out my phone and using the flat glass touch screen for every application I interact with, when I'm mixing music, I might use a turntable. If I'm playing a driving game, you know, I'll use a car wheel. So there's a lot of great reasons to use tangible input devices. Um, virtuosity, speed, benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Michael probably made you read some papers about it. I'm not going to go into that. So going to this deeply custom concept, um, you probably don't want to use the same, even though tangible input devices are great, you probably don't want to use the same input device to play games as you use to write your term papers. Um, and you probably don't want to use the same device as the person sitting next to you either, even if you're both writing term papers. Um, and it may also be that your desired input device changes when you're sitting in class and trying to be secret about texting versus when you're laying in your bed and you're thinking about what TikTok should I fall asleep to, right? So the, the sort of user task and context all really uniquely determine the kind of device that you want to use. Um, so making devices for all of these situations is really complicated. And uh, I've spent a long time thinking about it. But uh, today, we'll talk about like a few different things that we can think about for this. So the, uh, the things that I would like to cover are, how can we make functional devices quickly? Um, this is sort of like the bread and butter of the stuff that I do. Uh, we'll talk about how we design stuff to make it easy to sense. Um, we'll also talk about designing useful devices automatically, specifically for ergonomic reasons. Um, and then we'll talk about completely ignoring design and uh, thinking about other weird ways that we can conceptualize input devices. So talking about devices for sensing. Uh, I love 3D printing, laser cutting, and otherwise making stuff that we can sense. So uh, let's talk about a little bit of a strange sensing method. Well, honestly, they're both strange. But we'll start with uh, this one. So I'm going to talk about how to sense stuff using air as opposed to electronics. This is a sequence that I've used in probably every talk that I've ever given since 2012. Um, but the question is, how do you make a tangible input device? Uh, 
you create the shape of the device, usually using digital fabrication, you print out a shell, and then you come up with a bunch of electronics that you stuff inside, you do a bunch of soldering, you program your microcontroller, and then you can sense what people do with it. But as I'm sure you can guess, this is extremely tedious. If you need to change the design, it's super painful. So thinking about that, um, we, we came up with this idea of AirLogic. Uh, we presented this at WIST last year. So AirLogic is a system that uses fluerics, which I will tell you what that is in a second. Um, but we embed input, output, and computation in 3D printed objects. Uh, objects are produced as a single structure with minimal to no assembly. So what the heck is fluerics? Fluerics was developed between the 1960s and the 1980s when people were in the midst of the Cold War and afraid of radiation frying all their electronics. So they were like, well, what's kind of computer that won't be bothered by radiation? So they came up with this idea of fluid computing. So you basically shoot air through these very specially shaped channels and you can do logic, you can do storage, you can do all kinds of different stuff with these. And why does that make it a good uh, technique for tangible input devices? Um, it allows us to fully produce the shape. Okay, so we have the, the outer shape of the device and the function, so the input, output, and computation on a single machine in a single process. We can actually do sensing, so I'll talk about sensing. Um, we can do processing in terms of logic, uh, and we can do output all together. And objects that use air logic don't have to be reset in between uses. So there's been a lot of digital fabrication work on metamaterials that requires, you know, you can push a thing and it will transfer your signals through the metamaterial, but then if you want to run the computation again, you sort of have to reset it. So we don't have to do that. But how does it work? We rely on cu printing custom internal geometry uh, at the side there that's connected with tubes. Um, so we call these transits because unlike electronic circuits, the air only goes one way through. It doesn't come all the way back around. So this example bunny has a transit that can sense two input locations uh, on its head, and when either one is interacted with, it wiggles its tail. But how does it really work, right? So the transit that I described before, I've unfolded here, um, and it has two input widgets, one or logic widget and one wiggler. So when we put air through these widgets, it basically comes out the top. Um, but then if I cover one of them with my finger, suddenly the air is staying inside and it's heading into this next part, which is the logic gate. And basically the logic gate treats a stream of air as a one and no stream of air as a zero. Uh, so similar to the OR gates we all know, because this now has a one coming in one side and a zero coming in the other side, we want to send a one through and uh, it comes out by wiggling this widget at the end. So of course we can do more with AirLogic than just make a bunny. Um, so we developed a whole bunch of input, output, and logic widgets that we can use. The input widgets all sort of rely on this idea of keeping the air inside. So the air escapes in all these cases on the left where it's uh, open, and then it stays inside when it's closed. So we can close it with a finger, or we can close it with a button, rocker switches. We also developed some sliders and dials that let you choose between multiple uh, air inputs. Um, if you line them all up in 3D. Quick question. Just yeah. Sure Does the device have to be sitting on top of a fan or something like that? We use an air compressor. We, we mostly use an air compressor. We actually did do one with lungs, which I'll show as well. Okay. But, uh, but yes, you do need a source of air to okay. make this work. Logic widgets. Um, they're doing binary logic based on their inputs. So like I said before, presence of air is a one and absence of air is a zero. And the way that all of these work is the principle of jet de um, deflection or jet interaction, um, which tells us that a jet can actually, a jet of air can be redirected by another jet of air if we hit it in the right way. So we can use this for calculation. Here I have um, a schematic widget, and if I blow air through this side, it continues out that side. Same way if I blow air through this side, it continues straight out the other way. But if I blow air through both of them, I cancel out their angular momentum so that the air comes out instead across the middle. So we use this principle in all of our gates. And I'm sure that some of you realize that the gate I just described is an AND gate. So when both of the uh, inputs are present, we get an output on the channel that comes out to the right. So that's the channel that we're sampling to see if we have both A and B as true. 
We use a similar shape for XOR, uh, so except we sample a different channel. So in this case, when A and B are both true, we have the air coming out this thing, which pops into 3D. It's a little hard to understand from this image. Um, for not, we basically can use a single power stream, and when we have our A input present, it redirects away from the, uh, the sample. So we sample on this one on the top right to see if, if we have not A. And then the OR I talked about with the bunny, basically it works as a merge to connect the, the A and Bs both to the same out. So for the final part in the chain, we have all these different output widgets that we developed that give uh, visual, audio, um, or haptic feedback. So the, the top one pops a pin up so you can see when, when we have air present. The next one makes a whistle. We can wiggle the tail of the bunny like I showed, or this one spins a fan fast enough that you can feel the device vibrating in your hand. To play around with the widgets, we made a uh, Fusion 360 plugin that lets you, you know, drop them in, um, cut them out of your model, and include them. And then finally, of course, you print them out um, with all the widgets integrated. We also did a bunch of experiments to figure out how well they work, and uh, it turns out that it's really complicated. Um, I'm not going to go into it too much. 3D printers are very, well, they're not perfect yet. <laughs> that's, that's what I'll say. Um, but we made a lot of cool applications still, even given the, uh, the limitations of today's 3D printing. So this, uh, this object basically can tell when you've spelled whist correctly and it pops up a pin to tell you that that's right. Um, this device uh, lets you select between different pitches. Um, this is the lung powered one that I was talking about. So this one doesn't use an air compressor. Um, I apparently didn't get my sound going through this. But anyway. Uh, you can select pitches and play them on this whistle. There's obviously a lot of ways in which this is not as good as electronics, right? So we have pretty limited sensing. We also, even though in the 60s to 80s they did develop storage methods that use air, we could not, could not get those to work with our 3D printed stuff. Um, so there's, there's many ways in which this is like not quite as handy as just using um, microcontrollers. But there's also a lot of ways that it's way cooler. So these things don't care when they get wet. They don't care when they get irradiated, which is what they were originally designed for. They also, uh, they're, in some sense, they can be more sustainable because uh, you don't have to pull out any electronic parts or metal when you need to recycle them. You just throw the whole thing in the plastic bin, right? So it's 100% plastic, you push air through. There's also uh, places where you might have access to air or fluid flow um, that you don't have access to electricity, like when you're in a remote place in a national park, for example. Um, we explored using water pressure instead of air pressure for this. OK, so computers based on air, they have their place. But uh, I also really like traditional electronics. I think they're super interesting. Or I, I, I really like basic electronics, I'm going to say that. So the thing about electronics, the way that they're normally used in these devices is still really irritating, right? Like even when we say we want to include electronics, this idea of assembling all of them and powering all of them and using microcontrollers to sample them is still like not the best. So there's been a lot of work in HCI, um, especially in digital fabrication, to make devices that instead modify signals used by other devices. So what that usually looks like is uh, these things have specially printed conductors inside of them. These are all 3D printed. They have specially printed conductors inside um, that redirect in some way the, the conductive, or excuse me, the capacitive signal of the user onto the capacitive touchscreen. So in this case, we have passive plastic stuff that redirects our signals to another active device, which is a much more convenient way than putting active electronics in every device. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, but the challenge with these devices is that when you set them on the screen, of course, you have to sense them. So uh, there's basically two ways to sense multiple inputs on something like a touch screen. One is space multiplexing. So this device, if I touch it in the top left corner, that has some specific spot on the touch screen where the signal comes out. And if I touch it on the top right corner, that has some specific different place on the screen where it comes out. So as I add more inputs, I also have to add more footprint, right? So it comes out in different places on the touch screen, and I can tell those inputs apart. The other way that you can do it, well, OK, this is an obvious limitation, right? So a bigger, many more inputs requires many more, or much more space on our device. 
The other way we can do it is time multiplexing. So this is I squared C communication. I don't know if you've ever worked with this before, but basically when we have wires, if we send signals over time, ones and zeros over time, we can encode any data we want. That's like sort of the whole idea of the internet and everything else. Um, we can send arbitrary amounts of data if we have arbitrary amounts of time. This is also somewhat limited because it requires additional time to sense or understand additional inputs. And I've also never seen a passive version of this. So this is always, this always requires active electronics um, with power sensing and responding to stuff. So I'm gonna introduce a different idea, which is called signal space multiplexing. And I hope you will indulge my journey into uh, electrical engineering for just one second. Um, the idea of signal space multiplexing is that we're going to create different signals that are neither space multiplexed nor time multiplexed, but that are all sent at the same time and can be differentiated. We'll see how we do. Okay, the way your phone works. You basically touch and you connect. There's, there's a bunch of transmitting wires going one way and there's a bunch of receiving wires going the other way. And when you touch them, your finger takes out a tiny amount of current. Usually we talk about these as capacitive interfaces because our bodies have a capacitive signature. So there's some coupling between your body and the screen that causes this current to come out. However, it turns out, based on this paper by Ikematsu and Sio, that it's not just capacitance that they measure. It's this other quantity called impedance. So impedance connects capacitance, resistance, and another quantity called inductance, which I'm basically going to ignore for this talk, but, but instead of using only capacitive input on these things on our phones, we can actually use resistive input on them too, which is kind of cool. But because impedance actually measures capacitance and resistance, we can think about those things as separate quantities. Instead of just thinking about the, the single impedance, essentially length vector number that uh, we're getting from the touch device, we can break it down into its individual elements. So impedance is a complex resistance of a circuit. So it has a real component and it has an imaginary component. The real component is what we call resistance and the imaginary component is what we call capacitance. But touch devices report instead this value. Okay. It turns out there is a device that instead of just reporting impedance can actually report the real and complex or the real and imaginary components separately. So that's an LCR meter, and it's something that electrical engineers use all the time. You can ask it, so L is uh, inductance, and then C, which we're gonna see next, is capacitance, and then R is resistance. And these are all passive parts of impedance, this quantity that our phones tell us. So one of my new PhD students who is an electrical engineer got totally excited about this and was like, how can we use these individual parts separately in the same circuit. So let's talk about that. Here we have a button which is based on resistance. So we've hooked it up to our LCR meter. We have a simple circuit where it goes through the button back to the LCR meter. As you can see on the screen, the number changes when we press the button. Okay, so the resistance is changing. So okay, we pressed the button or we didn't press the button. We can do the same thing with the capacitive button. We hook up the capacitive button in a simple circuit. When we see the capacitance change, we're like, okay, we press the button. Not that exciting. However, when we put the two buttons in the same simple circuit, we can actually tell which one changed because we can look at the resistance and the capacitance separately. Even though they're in one circuit and they're passive devices, because they change their signatures differently, we can tell, okay, I know that the resistance is changing of this circuit, so I know I pressed the resistive button. Or I know the capacitance is changing, so I know I pressed the capacitive button. We can also figure out how much resistance we added. So there's this simple way that resistance is related. The total resistance of a circuit is just the resistance, the sum of all the resistances in it. The total capacitance of the circuit is related in this uh, sort of annoyingly, um, inverted way, but based on the total capacitance that we read of a circuit, we can tell how much capacitance we have added since the last time we checked. So this means we can stack multiple stuff. So all of these circle disks that he's adding are resistors, and the square disks are capacitors. And you can see that we can count up how many we've added, because we know what the total resistance is, we know what the resistances of our circles are. 
so we can tell how many we've put in the thing. We can also do continuous measurement. So here we have a joystick, which works in 2D. We have a capacitance going this way, and we have resistance going this way. And when we see the continuous changes, we can map it to a 2D continuous change, even though we still only have one wire. Uh, the other thing is, all continuous inputs look the same, so we had to do a small trick to get multiple variable things per L. Mm, yeah, so if we want to have multiple sliders that are resistive, it's a little bit hard to tell which one we slid, right? Because one ohm change looks the same no matter where it comes from. But we can actually do this trick where instead of having it be continuous, we have steps. So here we have a big plate, smaller plate, smaller plate. And we can tell what the difference is going to be when we slide to these different plates. So instead of seeing a smooth change, we see a stepped change. So in this way, we can have multiple variable components. These two are resistive, these two are capacitive. And because we know what the relative sizes of the steps are, we now know which ones we're changing. So anyway, there's a lot of physical laws and also material laws that govern how these things work, which I'm not gonna talk about. But the thing that I think is really cool is that we can 3D print all of them. So we're always back to 3D printing. Um, we did a bunch of experiments to explore how to do that. Of course, we built another uh, design tool that helps people create capacitors and resistors of their desired uh, values. Um, we also managed to manufacture them. Well, okay, we confirmed that uh, even though 3D printers do this shady thing where they sort of stack stuff up and they're really, uh, they're not creating homogenous materials, they still behave in the way that we would expect them to behave. They're roughly uh, proportional to, to what we would expect them to be proportional to when we change the lengths and, and uh, dimensions of these devices. And we can manufacture them. These, these rates don't look amazing, but compared to what you actually buy in the store, which is usually like plus or minus 10% on these uh, components, it's actually not too bad for, for printing them out. And anyway, because we can control the geometry, we can also error correct. So uh, if we predict things, um, if we have a slider that's got a capacitor on one side and a resistor on the other side, even if we aren't perfectly getting the exact values we expect, because we can have multiple channels at the same time, we can still do this error correction. So the capacitive resistor plus the resistive signature, or excuse me, the capacitive signature plus the resistive signature together give us a better signal than either one by itself. One thing about this is that it's not quite compatible with our smartphones yet, so we're looking into how we can do, do these on regular, quote unquote, um, sensing devices as opposed to this like weird electrical engineer's tool. But uh, the other cool thing is that you can actually use these with gloves on, so it doesn't matter if your body's capacitive or resistive because it's, it's all contained within the devices. Although I guess the glove thing, maybe you don't care in Stanford, we care a lot more in Denmark. <laughs> um, we also have thought a little bit about inductance, but it's not nearly as popular in HCI for whatever reason, probably because we have capacitive touch screens. So anyway, we, we had a lot of fun exploring uh, signal space multiplexing and the kinds of things that we can do by splitting up this supposedly simple signal into multiple parts and looking at all the parts separately. Okay, now we're just gonna talk about shapes, which is hopefully way easier than electrical engineering. Um, the question is, how should devices be shaped? Uh, we can design focused on users. So we, uh, we were thinking about, I found this industrial design thesis that says that there are no detailed guidelines for designing everyday life products adapted to the users, anthropometrics, and physics, which is sort of a horrifying statement when you think about it. Like, the idea that we have people who professionally do this kind of design and are telling us that there aren't guidelines to do it is, um, I, I found it moderately sketchy. But, uh, but there are some kinds of guidelines. So ergonomic guidelines have been around for a long time. They say simple things like, we want the largest possible contact area between a surface and our hand. So when I'm designing like a drill handle, you know, I wanna be able to touch as much of it as possible. I don't want a tiny drill handle that I'm like pinching in a weird way, right? Um, we also need to be able to wrap our fingers around them in a particular way. We wanna align it to our wrists so that we're not giving ourselves carpal tunnel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the thing about mass manufacturing is that everybody gets the same devices, right? But with digital fabrication, of course, we can help users get their own devices. 
So my other PhD student who's a mechanical engineer, um, he's thinking a lot about how we can help people create these devices suited to themselves. Um, also, as a heads up, this is still very much work in progress, so I'm excited to hear your comments and thoughts about it. So, okay, parametric geometry is something that basically says we can take a shape and we can define it relative to some measurement. Um, for example, I 3D printed my husband's wedding ring, and basically what I did to do that is I measured how big his finger was, and then I said I want the circle of the ring to be as big as his finger. Right, that's parametric geometry. It just rescales stuff to fit other stuff. So in this case, it makes sense that all we have to do is make parametric geometry that integrates hand dimensions and that follows the rules, right? I just showed you the rules, there's rules. So the problem's done, right? I mean, no, it turns out that it's not. So sometimes the rules actually turn out to conflict. Um, sometimes if we have an existing object, like a drill or a game controller, where the grip is bigger than our hands are already, the ideal grip for us is smaller than it started out with, which means we can't just print and add more stuff. Um, it's also the case that if you're designing something from scratch and you want a whole bunch of buttons on it, it can be really complicated to fit them all. So at the end of the day, the user has to be involved with these kinds of decisions. So, uh, okay, I'm gonna talk about those in a second. Um, so at the end of the day, users have to be involved. Wow, that's super low resolution, I apologize. Um, so another Fusion 360 plugin, mm -hmm. super cool. Um, we, we built this software system that lets users think about how they want to integrate the rules and the dimensions and all of this stuff. So we, uh, we start by scanning people's hands and getting their preferences for, for what the, the rotation of their wrist should be in its sort of rest position. Um, and then we can go through the flow of the tool. So here we're designing this precision tool that has a trigger. So this is, um, th this is a device that you would use to uh, precisely sort of select or cut things. It's actually a medical tool, so it's for, for surgeries. So we're trying to like direct people's hands in a very precise way. So in this case, we specify kind of uh, whether we want a precision grip or a power grip, and then you know if we want input, to input components. So in this case, we have this, this button trigger thing. It'll basically place them uh, from scratch for the user. Um, we can also lay out a whole bunch of buttons. We have not tried generating a Twiddler yet, although that is gonna be one of our stress tests, which I'm very excited about. Have any of you ever seen a Twiddler before, by the way? Other than Michael. Have you seen a Twiddler before? Yeah, it's the one-handed keyboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a keyboard that you, you enter letters by pressing multiple keys at the same time. So instead of pressing the A key to, to press A, you press like you know your middle finger and your first finger to press A, and then, anyway, it's very interesting. Uh, they were popular in the 90s. But anyway, they have a ton of buttons. Popular is a strong word. They were max popularity. There we go. Yeah, peak popularity in the 90s. Perfect. Um, but it's a great stress test to see, you know, how many buttons can we fit on an object. Uh, we can also add geometry to existing tools. So if we take the existing tool model, uh, here we've got the existing tool in gray, and then we've got our custom geometry in yellow. Um, we can print some stuff out, and then we can glue it on to our existing tool. So sometimes, as I mentioned, uh, it can be the case that our perfect grip is actually smaller than the existing grip, so we also have to help users add stuff on um, so that they can align the forces of their new grip with the, uh, the actual power axis of their device. Um, we had a whole bunch of users come into our lab and test out customized devices versus default devices to do a bunch of different tasks. So we made them saw things, drill things, type on those horrific keyboards that I showed you. We made them play Nintendo, we made them dig in the dirt. Um, and except for the Twiddler task, actually, these studies were very popular. People loved doing these uh, tasks. But we measured, we, we videotaped their performance um, and we measured uh, some features of the grips. So we measured how well do they actually adhere to these guidelines. It turns out, by following the rules, we adhere to the rules, incredible. Um, and, uh, but this is, this is only sort of like alignment features. And one of the most interesting features, I think, is contact area. So max contact area is super, super important. Um, and the way that we figured out how much contact area we had with a tool was actually we froze the tools and then handed them to people, and then we took thermal pictures of their hands. Yeah, that was super fun. People did not like it. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, we got these really nice pictures, and we do some basic computer vision to figure out you know, what's the area difference between the, 
the default and the personalized tool. Um, based on contact area, our tools all did better. Uh, they also increased user performance in a lot of cases, except for in the Nintendo case, because it turns out we had one relatively older user who had played a ton of Nintendo on the original controllers. And he kind of threw off all of our statistics, but that's fine. <laughs> um, we asked them about our, oh, excuse me, we asked them about their experiences, and this is one of the questions that we asked. So there was a lot of variation between user preferences, and we found some interesting stuff, like it turns out that the shape of our hands is not everything. So people had different hardnesses of hand, which affected how well the grips worked in their hands. Um, and that's never been captured in ergonomic guidelines, so we're interested to see like where that goes. So in addition to different things for every user, we're also interested in different inputs for every task. This is something we haven't done yet. But uh, these are, as I'm sure you can see, keyboard heat maps. And they are for three different video games. Can anyone guess any of these video games based on the heat maps? And also tell me why you think it's that. User Jane. lick my Nazgul. It seems like maybe they're playing a platformer because the like WASD keys are very hot, which are usually like navigating keys. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Is Razor maybe like StarCraft or something like that? Because they're not using the right side of the keyboard, I imagine it's just left-handed mouse the whole time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Other thoughts? So, StarCraft. Not, not a platformer exactly, but the WASD thing was bang on. So this is you know, CSGO. Uh, World of Warcraft is interesting because you get the WASD heat, but then you also get um, chat. So, uh, so it's sort of like a general use of the whole keyboard. Um, but anyway, the point is that the difference in these tasks on the same input device is totally measurable. So we can tell apart different tasks by looking at their fingerprints, but we can also measure specific people as they perform those tasks. So uh, it could reveal things about like personal style, right? If I'm looking at um, people playing Baldur's Gate, then uh, if I look at my keyboard heat map as it develops, then we can figure out whether I'm the kind of person who needs fast access to the fireball per button or whether I'm the person who needs fast access to the run button, right? So this is sort of a, a question of what do we need to give you like specific users access to as they're doing their own specific tasks? So this is future work for this uh, layout question of, of where do we put things on devices. OK. Now we've talked a lot about intentional design um, for these deeply custom devices. We talked about sensing, and we talked about shape. Uh, but what if we don't have the time or ability to design exactly the right thing at exactly the right time for what we need? One thing we can do is just pick up whatever is around, right? So if you've heard the term ubiquitous computing, the dream of ubiquitous computing is that computing vanishes into our environments and everything you know, could be computational, maybe it's computational, maybe it's not. Uh, but there's a lot of interesting interactive objects already in our environments. So for example, this pair of scissors, right? This is interactive, we go like this. That's an interaction. We also have this rubber band, also interactive. We've got water bottles. We know how to screw and unscrew water bottles. Um, and there's tons of these like physical affordances on passive devices that are already everywhere around us. This could, uh, if we think about this in a computational context, then we could do something like slide a slider when we you know, move a, a box knife in and out. Or we could zoom a picture by stretching a rubber band. Or we could squeeze this ball to uh, control um, a volume thing. Or we could twist a dial to tw twist a dial, right? Um, I actually think this is hilarious because the idea that we took a physical dial and then turn it into a digital widget, which we now are controlling back again with a physical widget, sort of appealing on like a, an art level. But anyway, that's what we're going to talk about doing. So how could we possibly sense interacting with a water bottle? We have to look, instead of looking at instrumenting the water bottle, instead of instrumenting the human. So we've got all this cool stuff in our arm. Um, these images are from Gray's Anatomy book not TV, and uh, they show all the weird things that we have inside. So the dark gray stuff is muscles, the uh, bright yellow stuff is um, uh, tendons, the red stuff is arteries, um, oh no, I'm sorry, the, the yellow stuff is nerves, the red stuff is arteries, and the orange stuff is tendons. 
So we have all these different things in different parts of our arm. And as we do tasks, they're all sending each other mechanical signals and electrical signals. So um, for example, if you think about your heart beating, right? There's a mechanical signal where this is when people go like this on your wrist, right? They're feeling for that mechanical signal of the blood pushing through your veins. You can also, I'm, I'm lucky that my wrist is very obvious when I do this, but when you wiggle your fingers around, you can see the tendons changing, right, in your wrist. And uh, the position of those is actually uniquely determined by the position of your fingers. Um, we can also tell, so if you close your hand and then you squeeze it harder, your fingers haven't moved, but the amount of force that you're outputting has moved, so the tension on your muscles and tendons also changes. So we can tell not just what shape your hand is in, but how much force you're outputting, just based on looking at what's going on in your wrist. So as I said, you know, the, the pose and motion of the things in our wrist can tell us a little bit about, you know, if, if my hand is in this shape, I'm probably holding something of this shape, right? So the shape of my hand is now telling me something about the shape of what I'm interacting with. Um, the motion of my hand is telling me something about the way in which I'm interacting with it. And then as we also mentioned, we can tell from the muscle tension, uh, the force that we're exerting, or maybe the weight of the object that we're holding. This is work that I did while I was in industry um, with my colleagues and an intern at Taxual Labs uh, that we presented at TEI last year. So we built this really cool wristband, which uh, uses capacitive sensing to look at essentially a high resolution depth map of your wrist as you do different stuff with it. Um, so we can see here the signature changing as the hand moves around and as it stretches out this rubber band. We put this on a whole bunch of different people, and I'm sure you will not be surprised to learn that different people's wrists look different. Um, especially you can see this is this, okay. So the green thing at the top is our sensor, and then the flesh, different flesh colored things are like the inferred shape of the wrist. So these were wrists at rest. And then we have the circumference of the forearm of different people. And you can see there's huge changes from the smallest wrists that we looked at to the biggest wrists that we looked at, partially due to like the tightness of our device. But th the point is that we, uh, we learned that it's not gonna be easy to get enough data to make one machine learning model work for everybody, right? So these wrists were just two different, so we focused on like one user at a time. Um, and we did some analysis, this is a thing from biology, that uh, lower is better. So point one is kinda low, so it tells us that we're looking at probably the same structure, but it's not low enough that we can actually like use the data over and over. Then we looked at taking it off and putting it back onto the same person's wrist, so these are repeat um, performances of, of the same user over time. And you can see that the shape more or less stays the same, so that's super good. Uh, and here we have a, a smaller number, so 0.05 is small enough that we can reuse data between placements to an extent. Um, we know that a user's wrist continues to look the same, which is very much a relief. Um, so okay, to understand whether we could see what force does to people's arms, we were doing this during COVID, so we actually sent them a big envelope full of springs. We sent out 15 big envelopes of springs. Um, so there were 10 springs in each envelope that had different forces required to squish them, and we made them squish the springs. So this is uh, squishing a light spring and a slightly heavier spring and a heavier spring. So you can see that in addition to the uh, muscle tension required, there's also a change in the user's hand pose actually, which is interesting when they squeeze stuff of different forces. Um, and we got like, a reasonable error, 13 newtons, when we're on this scale of four to 49 is not amazing, but it does show us that there is some correlation here in the data. We also wanted to understand whether this pose thing that I said was correct. So can we tell from a user's hand pose what the shape of the object is, or like are their grips essentially repeatable? So we sent them a bunch of Play-Doh in different shapes. There were six, there were four objects that they used six different grasps on, so you can see the six grasps here, and we got classification accuracy of 81%. This is the stuff that I think is way less interesting than this part. So even though the data was not as amazing as we would have liked, we still decided that we would go ahead and build a system to see if we could do what I talked about before where you squeeze a ball to control the volume. Um, so we built this system where basically you demonstrate the extremes. So here I'm demonstrating the maximum, the middle position, and then the minimum. And then we send this 
to our uh, machine learning pipeline. We do feature extraction and we train two models. So one to tell us what kind of interaction we're doing and one to tell us where in the range we are. So when I go activate the uh, thing, it's first comparing my twisting to all of these other things I have planned to figure out, okay, okay, so she's twisting, perfect. And then it's regressing where in the twist I am. So this does actually enable, this is like real um, data, this enables these sort of magical interactions with passive stuff in our environments, just by sensing what our hands are doing. Um, and we had users do a study where they had to input values using their chosen devices. This one I love because it's actually an oscilloscope that he turned off, which would normally sense you know, the dial twisting, but instead he sensed it from his wrist. Anyway, th th it's just a fun, fun thing that he did. Um, so it, we can use these for, for useful input. And our users told us that they felt like superheroes. Uh, they had all these very positive things to say about using the objects. And it turns out that the quantitative data we collected said that they didn't do any better with the objects than they did by just doing freehand gestures. But they liked them better, so that's what's important, I guess. One thing that I like here as an idea is that uh, instead of having um, devices that we intentionally 3D print that are full of sensors, we could actually make stuff out of cardboard, right? So we can prototype, we could do paper prototyping and then sense people's interactions with it. And I haven't done this follow-on study yet, but I think it's very exciting to think about what's the lowest, lowest barrier to entry way that we could do prototyping of physical stuff. All right. The last thing I'm gonna talk about is a slightly crazy way to combine uh, the ideas of design and sensing. Um, which I'm currently like in the early planning stages of. So this is like a grant application that I've submitted and we're gonna see if anybody thinks that it's believable. So uh, this is what it is like today when you need an object with which to interact with your environment. Here you have found a screw which you need to drive into some wood. Um, and you don't have a screwdriver, but you know that's easy enough so we can if we have the skills, we can 3D model a screwdriver or we can go to Thingiverse and download a screwdriver or whatever. So we uh, find this 3D model and then we print it out and then we go and we're like, oh, this is actually not the right screwdriver, right? So we actually needed a Phillips head screwdriver, the plus instead of the flat head. So okay, we can go back and iterate, but this is like a little bit annoying. Um, in the case of Phillips head versus flat head, you don't have to be a screwdriver expert to figure out that you need the shape of the screwdriver to fit the shape of the screw. Um, but there are other challenges that can be way more complicated. So for example, if a screw is in a corner, you might need a special device that transforms your twisting of the screw so that it goes into the corner the right way. If the screw is stripped, maybe a Phillips head or a flat head will not work. You need actually something special which will help you fit into that bit. Um, and then if you can't output the amount of torque that's required to move the screw, then you might need a special device that lets you use larger muscle groups to, to actually get it out of there, right? So this comes back to uh, the challenges um, by this industrial designer. So there's no detailed guidelines for how to help people design these things. So instead of designing them, the, the way that you actually do this design is really con complex to conceptualize, even for people who do physical design stuff. Um, you require knowledge about the task, you require knowledge about the tool, you require knowledge about the user, and you may not have all of those things when you go to design the tool, right? There's dynamic interactions between them that are challenging to predict, even in this world of like mega big AI. And uh, it's, it's also the case, of course, that you need to know then how to 3D model and how to 3D print and all of this stuff. So the idea that I have is, instead of doing modeling explicitly, through a user or a designer requesting stuff before we make these objects, we instead have the user demonstrate and fail to do things while they're doing the task. So in the screwdriver scenario, we can start with the basic screwdriver and then using knowledge of our surroundings, we can design, we can optimize the design to make sure the screw is reachable. We can print it with embedded sensing structures so that it can tell how well it's contacting, contacting the screw head, uh, as well as you know, the amount of torque that we're outputting onto it. And then from the sensed output that we're getting from this screwdriver, we can iteratively print new screwdrivers that are getting better and better, right? So we can evolve the screwdriver to the task that we're doing with the screw. So to go through sort of the whole thing, um, you find a screw that you're aiming to fasten and you give 
some command, whatever, get a basic screwdriver. Uh, and then because of what we know about your body um, and the space that you're working in, we give you a screwdriver that's got a right angle already on it um, that's balanced well for your muscles. Um, we can also decide that maybe the most important thing to print, instead of you know, printing the whole screwdriver each time, maybe all we need to print is the bit. So 3D printers are unfortunately very stupid and they start at the bottom of an object and they print up, but instead we can try to think about what is a salient part? What's the important part of the screwdriver to print? And maybe we print that first. So we don't start at the bottom and go up. We instead start at the important part, which is the bit, test it out first. But of course, we don't want an ordinary bit. We want something that's got sensing inside. So then when we go and print the things and test them out, we can tell how well we're contacting the screw, how well we're outputting the force that we expected, and then we can iterate based on what we see, just reprinting parts that aren't performing well. So we end up with a screwdriver that evolves as we use it to perfectly match the task, the context, and us. So I think that this idea of taking modeling out of the equation and instead authoring through failure is uh, pretty interesting. Um, so if we define authoring as guessing and using and sensing and iterating, then uh, we get rid of this whole idea that we know what the problem is up front, because we often don't know what the problem is up front. Um, and thinking about how, how to interact then with systems that are sort of like understanding our failure in situ is sort of exciting. And I did use, I wrote find, fix, verify in here, by the what? way. Just, uh, <laughs> the last time I, wrote I don't know. Um, but uh, the other thing about this is that even though I use 3D printing all the time to make finished objects, I don't think that it should be a tool that we use at the end of a chain to make an object that we know is gonna be the right object, right? I think it's an opportunity for us to interact with something physical that we might use in different ways. Um, they're not just static configurations of like a big chunk of material. They're things that we can morph or redefine or reconfigure. Um, we can also use this opportunity to think about like critical paths and stuff. And I know that this is something that's done in manufacturing where you don't wanna like prototype the whole thing each time. But I think in HCI we've lost a little bit of that in our digital fabrication research. I also have a lot of colleagues that work on VR and uh, they find it compelling that the virtual world can be changed rapidly using only software. Um, but I think that if we put sensing in the right places and use it in the right ways, we can actually change the physical world just the same as we do in virtual reality. So VR in this case um, uses the fact that we've tied sensing and rendering together into a single system. But now that fabrication is sort of this more sophisticated uh, um, technology uh, and we can leverage you know, the speed and, and flexibility of it, I think that we can do the same, the same kind of thing with, with fabrication. Um, so this, this project that I have here, basically what they did was they had users pressing different buttons, right? And then over time, they made the user's fingers longer and longer so that they got better performance on the buttons. And I think we can do the same thing with fabrication. I think we could do the same thing in the real world. So. Okay. So we made it through a lot of different projects that get around the idea of finding or making input devices that are well matched to users or their tasks or their contexts. We talked about shape, we talked about sensing. We also talked about completely ignoring shape and sensing and focusing on usage um, and letting devices emerge sort of from the context in which they're being used. And then, uh, yeah, as I noted, these are in varying stages of completion, all these projects I mentioned, so I'm really excited to hear your questions. Um, of course, I want to thank my collaborators at KU and everywhere else, and this is not all of them. This slide, um, anyway, I need a bigger slide. That's all I need. <laughs> uh, I also want to thank the people who give me money to do these things because I love money. Um, and now I'm happy to take your questions. Yeah. I really love the last research vision of like iterating through failure and also designing like specific things and not like end to end things in fabrication. I was wondering if you thought a little bit about the sustainability like um, implications for that because I would imagine like with iteration and also physical fabrication comes a bunch of like failed prints and like stuff. For sure. Um, yeah, so part of the, the thing that I think about that is many of the projects that I work on are actually focused on how can we make structural interactive devices as opposed to electronic based ones. So they are, for example, AirLogic is already more sustainable than something else. Even though it's not as 
fancy as something electronics based, you can just throw the whole thing in the recycler. And yes, I agree that there is a sustainability perspective, um, but I think that it can be mitigated through using the right kinds of design and essentially like improved material science. It's totally like an active area of research right now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so when we start out, does it is it supposed to just look like the way like a regular screwdriver or something looks, and then, or like I guess what I'm thinking about was was the very first iteration, and then like yeah. what we iterate through to like yeah. So, so I imagine starting with something basic or or something that we can. There's certain things, like I talked about the hands, right? So I can already know how big your hands are. There, there's no mystery there, right? Um, but the question about like the dynamic interaction between you and the stuff that you're working on, that's something that's really hard to know up front. So we can make some adjustments beforehand, but some have to be made as we do the task. Mm -hmm. Could you comment a little bit more about like how far you guys have pushed the, the when it comes to air logic, like beyond just like simple gates to try to find what, uh, th th uh, I guess facilitate the interaction. Like, how far have you pushed it in terms of logic? How complex can you make things? Um, so we can do, right now, the way that our system is built, you have to have balanced logic gates. So we can have, you know, if we do one and and one and, then we can do another and down here. But we can't do an and and then have an and that's got, like, an imbalance because of the way that we're currently using our, uh, our air. Um, in... In the historical systems, I don't think I have this slide, but uh, in the historical systems, they have a slightly different design that doesn't require balanced airflow. And so that design is a lot harder to 3D print, but you can actually laser cut it. So we're working on how to laser cut these structures and then basically like slot them into 3D prints instead of printing the whole thing because there, there is still a ton more that we can do. It just requires not having the like crappy ridges, right? The crappy ridges mess everything up. Yeah. In the space of like, not your problem, I'm curious, for the, for example, for the top two projects there, mm -hmm. you kind of gesticulated toward, well, we can't do this yet in everyday touchscreens. Is that because the touchscreen is, it, it's just a matter of the math and they, they're not doing the math? Or does it, is there something about that sensor you're using that you actually, that is not built in? And likewise with the TEI project, I'm just curious, what would it take to embed that kind of thing into an Apple Watch or something like this? Like, are these are these far off? Are these near term? Like, how hard is this ultimately going to be? So, um, the first one about the touch screens, there's there's some extra components that would need to be added, just like basically capacitors and resistors to compare to, so that you can get these um, values correctly. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of math and a little bit of extra electronics, uh, but I don't think it's like a far off goal, especially because we don't have to have a general purpose LCR meter. We can like design an LCR meter that's matched to the stuff we want to sense, right? Yeah. So we can uh, be a little bit smart about what we select there. Um, that's something we are still thinking about trying to figure out how to do. Um, in terms of embedding that in Apple Watch, it's actually, I don't yeah, uh, it's actually almost possible now. Um, the the kind of sensing that it does is not, like, essentially we have this like ugly prototype thing, right, which is sort of bulky, but the, the sensing technique itself doesn't require anything special. So it would, uh, it would require a little more of the battery of the watch, and you'd have to be clever about when you like activate it or whatever, but, uh, but it, I, I think that that is actually maybe more near term than the cell phones thing, because the Apple Watch people are willing to pay a little bit more than they are on their phones. <laughs> I saw a hand over here. Oh yeah, I was, so for the computer vision one about mm -hmm. using the objects in context, you mentioned you had two models, the first of which to classify like what motion you're trying to do, mm -hmm. and then the second of which to classify where in the motion. Yes. I guess I was curious about that second model because it seems like to classify where you are in a twist is different than where you are in a squeeze. Like, is that second model really able to be able to, do, or is it just like, so it's per, it's per interaction. Okay. So because we demonstrate the max, the middle, and the min of each thing, once we've decided, OK, I'm twisting, then we look at the regression just of twisting. We can't generalize that, unfortunately. Okay. 
like anatomy is way too crazy to generalize stuff, which is, <laughs> that's just life. Um, good question though. Uh, yeah. I had a comment because recently I've uh, seen that Apple has patented uh, the, the, the pinch mechanism mm -hmm. using the, the watch, right? So I think, I, I don't know how, how far from that we are, but I think maybe they're bringing up a point of view of visually uh, judging what you're interacting to and then capture, inferring and, and making the connection, even if, we, if you do it simpli in a simplified way, perhaps. Mm. So I, I think it maybe goes towards the, your direction, right? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a uh, way of approaching. I feel like the, the pinching thing has gotten really popular with AR, VR stuff. And, uh, and it's not, well, it, it, I have seen patents that like listen for the sound of pinching and patents that like, you know, d do all these different things. There's been a ton of different people trying to figure out how can we tell when people pinch so we can have them do this in AR and VR. But uh, the, the thing about this um, device that we worked on is that it works even if I'm like doing something behind my back, right? So I don't have to have the, the glasses, but, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of richness that I think Apple hasn't quite put in there yet. But I think they, 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 they were using the capacitance oh, were they? from the Apple Watch. Yeah, so you close a lot. And, and by sensing the differences of, inter I don't know if each finger mm -hmm. has a different capacitance, but anyways, they're using the actual Apple Watch and together, maybe with the vision, they complement. Oh, I see, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. I see in recent. I'm going to look at that. Yeah, and I, I got get wondering how cool it would be for learning an instrument, for instance. Your, sure. Yeah. So you have a close, not only sensing the person, but also giving back, oh, maybe you can pinch less the, yeah, the string yeah, yeah. or more. Right. Interesting. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's tons of cool applications in like manual skill learning, which is again one of these things where like I have a colleague working on skill learning in VR. Um, and, uh, and I think it's, well, I just think it's fun to use her research everywhere that I can. So uh, skill learning in the real world, that's what I'm about now. <laughs> All right, let's thank our speaker.